that is a fireside chat on reset, rethink, co-working design and tech. So let me first introduce our panel members here. The session will be chaired by Ramesh Nair, CEO, India and Managing Director, Market Development, Asia Colliers. With a diverse experience of over 23 years, Mr. Ramesh Nair's career has been focused on driving transformational change and delivering real estate solutions to domestic and multinational owners, investors, and occupiers across India and South Asia. At Colliers, Ramesh is overseeing the overall direction, strategy, and growth of the India's business. He also drives business development and key relationship management across EPIC. Well, a very warm welcome to our Session moderator, Mr. Ramesh Nair, and let me now introduce our speakers in an alphabetical order. Mr. Karan Chopra, co-founder and chief revenue officer, Table Space. He is an experienced entrepreneur with a demonstrated history of working in real estate and digital industries. He started Table Space five years ago, sensing an opportunity in the growing need for integrated and managed workspaces among enterprise clients. Under his leadership, Table Space has grown from one to six key cities in India with a footprint of over 4 million square feet and servicing over 100, 100 enterprise clients, mostly Fortune 500 companies. Our next eminent panel member is Mr. Nitesh Sarda, founder of SmartWorks. Founded in 2016, SmartWorks is India's largest provider of enterprise-focused managed and flexible office spaces, which is leveraging its robust digital platform to deliver tech-enabled, fully serviced, flexible, and affordable workspaces. With over 5 million square feet under management across 32 plus locations in nine cities, SmartWorks caters to Fortune 500 companies, large enterprises, SMEs, and established unicorns and startups. Our next and final member, let me introduce Parthajit Sarma, Senior Associate, Advanced Workplace Associate. Parthajit is a workplace strategy and change management consultant partnering with global clients to co-create future business scenarios by way of a deep understanding of work, workers, and workplaces in the digital age. In fact, his work over two decades in this domain has resulted in a book titled The Radically Changing Nature of Work, Workers, and Workplaces. With, and with an educational background in design and management, Parthajit is also Shevning Scholar for Science and Innovation. So this is our eminent panel. And let me now hand it over to Mr. Nayan. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Apna. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Visible? Yeah. Great. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for your uh, attention. My name is uh, Ramesh Nair and I work with uh, Colliers. Uh, welcome to this uh, co-working summit uh, and uh, awards. Uh, I'd like to thank Reality Plus for organizing uh, this event. Uh, today, today we are going to be uh, discussing co-working design and uh, technology. So, we have our expert panelists who are all uh, high-performing uh, leaders, industry uh, stalwarts uh, in the co-working uh, domain. Uh, our uh, efforts uh, is to provide you with some interesting uh, topics and uh, interesting uh, speakers. Uh, let, me, let me start with uh, you, uh, Nitish. Uh, Nitish, uh, how, is, how is technology uh, fueling uh, uh, the rise of uh, Flex space and tech innovations uh, in uh, in flex spaces. Sorry, I'm new. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, am I audible now? Yeah, audible. Awesome. Uh, so I think technology, uh, Ramesh. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me here on this uh, uh, on, on this conversation. Um, I think how technology is being looked at specifically now, where people have started thinking about work from anywhere or work from home or bring a uh, home to work sort of a concept is that it has now become an essential part of your work environment, right? You need technology to essentially help you, uh, uh, you know, schedule, uh, for example, if you're doing uh, alternate day working, if you're doing booking uh, your seats while when you're coming to work, the workspace strategy, which is now evolving from a fixed desk to a flexible desk, that requires technology for it to be enabled. Um, and I think technology is going to be the thing which around which everything is going to be sur surrounded, right? Earlier, co-working was only focusing on services and building out the space. Design and services used to be the two most important thing. I think for us, is, uh, we've added another layer, which is the tech layer. Uh, now we actually take tech, design, and then services all parallel to each other uh, when we look at uh, office spaces. So I think you will see a lot of innovation happen over the next 
two to three years that you hadn't seen in the last ten years. But I think tech has become essential rather than just a good to have. Uh, thanks, uh, Natish. Uh, Karan, uh, let me uh, ask you the next uh, question. What are some of the new services you have uh, started offering uh, in the last uh, last couple of uh, years since COVID started? Sure. Hi, Ramesh. Hi, Natish, and hi, everybody nice. else. So yeah, of course, Ramesh. Um, you know, integration of uh, everything when, like Nitish said, technology services, etc., is key for any service provider today. Having said that, we need to keep innovating uh, every now and then. And of course, COVID has, um, you know, changed the way we we think, and we focused on multiple different services that we feel could uh, be more beneficial to a lot of clients. Though I think a lot of clients themselves are kind of figuring out a way to bring people back to work. But I think services like creating more engagement platforms within your centers, uh, for example, we try to do a lot of art events, uh, stuff like uh, more and more engagement events, uh, leadership thought summits within our centers, which are typically uh, streamed live to all our uh, clients and which they would you know kind of access everywhere which kind of lightens up the mood of each and every person who's working from home and gives him some kind of motivation and a fun factor to come back to work i think there's a lot of talks around only and only work i think there's a social impact that needs to be uh dwelled upon what can you add to their overall well-being even when they are sitting at home not just making sure that they are completing their projects, but I think making sure that they are socially connected to the environment which they typically miss. So I think we create a lot of engagements within the organization and within our, our, our centers, which allow clients to see what's happening at site and kind of start missing going back to work. And hence, it kind of intrigues them to, yeah, guys, you know what, I'm socially missing a lot of stuff. And why don't I you know, start going back to work? That is one aspect of the social aspect. I think other things like uh, Nitesh also mentioned, you know, there's a lot of technologies obviously at the top of the spectrum at the moment. So creating stuff like, uh, you know, app controlled car parking and bike parking so that whenever a person comes to work, he has that uh, ease of, you know, parking and uh, lift management services cafeteria occupancy tech, wherein a person doesn't have to go into very dense, highly occupied cafeteria. So we provide that kind of data onto their, uh, onto table space app as well. Creating a lot of, we focus a lot on, on health and fitness as well. So we've got trainers for, on across all our centers who are encouraging a lot of people who are coming to work to get back into fitness because a lot of people have been sitting at home, sitting on the same chair, lagging around. There are different kinds of health issues, which I'm sure you guys are aware of because a lot of topics have been discussed around health issues working from home. So our endeavor it is not just to get people back to work, but socially also engage so that they're intrigued to come back to work and make it a more fun uh, rather than making it more stressful than saying, yeah, I have to go back to work now. We want to say like, you know what, I really want to have fun. Hence, I want to go back to work. So these are some of the services you want to call it service or you want to call up some of the things that we are doing to make sure, or rather trying to make sure that people come back to work. Thanks, uh, Karan. Apart, what are some of the big uh, innovations we are seeing in workplaces? Hi, hi think, Ramit. Yeah, hi. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Karan. Okay. No, no, please go ahead, Pradeji. I would love to hear it from you. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. I'll, I'll add on to you. <laughs> uh, please, please, please. I'm fine. I'm just going on. That's okay. okay, okay. Hi, hi, everyone. No, I think all the good, word, uh, good words have already been spoken, so, so to say. Uh, Karan will add to this. But uh, lots of innovations, Ramesh. And uh, it's very really difficult to point out and you know, select few. And, uh, but I, there's one thing which I'd like to point out, and that is really that uh, this has this, uh, really been driven more by occupiers this time than by architects and designers. And my designer friends would hate me for saying this, but let me try and explain. I mean, for a lot of organizations and for a lot of employees as well, the way work is done itself has been reconstructed, right? Thanks to COVID. And then they begin to appreciate that there's a linkage between this new constructive work and the workplace. This uh, So changes and in innovation in the workplace is the kind of stuff that Nitesh spoke about, Karan spoke about. It's bound to happen. It is bound to happen. Now, the other shift which is happening is the acceptance that one size does not really fit all. I mean, earlier organizations wanted to build a uh, like a smart works like office or a Google like office because they felt that this will perhaps help them imbibe the same culture that these offices foster. But 
it it doesn't really work that way, does it? I mean, it 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 actually works the other way around. You need to identify what are the organizational uh, goals and what are people's aspirations, what is the culture, and the kind of stuff that Karan spoke about that they do, and then use these insights uh, to bring about changes in the workplace that support their own unique constructive work and not be a copy of someone else's constructive work. And 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 if this uniqueness really means that you have a rather unconventional constructive work in the previous panel, I was hearing was somebody talking about opening offices in Shimla and Goa, and so be it. And that's why you have these new concepts like, you know, workation, somebody was telling about workation, work and vacation, where organizations take up these places in these, you know, places like Goa and Shimla and give an option to, to their employees to work from there. So you can well imagine now that the look and feel of such an office is likely to be distinctly different from the look and feel of an office in say, say BKC or, or Central Bangalore, because they serve completely different purposes. Now, will some of these unconventional, un unconventional things work out? I mean, it's too early to say, but uh, I think leadership is at least making an attempt to establish a linkage between workplaces and their unique culture and constructive work. Sorry, long answer. Karan, you can add to that. <laughs> Karan, you want to add to that? No, no, I think uh, bang on, uh, I must say that, you know, there's a lot of uh, stuff and like he rightly said that it's my guess versus yours. So I think a lot of people are trying to figure out we are all trying to do unconventional stuff uh, to make sure. And it's not because we want, we want people to come back to work, not because we create spaces, but I think it's, it's, uh, it, 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 it motivates us also as operators or as managed workspace providers to see people coming back to work and having fun. Because we've seen that in the uh, 2018 and 19, we've already seen that. And now what we thought was working very well in 18, 19 may not necessarily work well in 21, 22, 23. So I think it's not the way you only build the office. I think it's the hospitality angle, the social angle that needs to kind of really, really go up the curve and uh, figure out a way to make sure that uh, end of the day, everybody wants to have, I mean, I love to have fun when I come to work. So I feel everybody should have fun when they come to work. So that's why we feel that's our table space things. And that's what we're trying to build around what we provide. Karan, what are, what are some of those big uh, design changes you're doing? Uh, if if it came to a table space center like two years back and today, what are the big design changes we'll see? Great, great question. I think Ramesh, you've heard this from me before also. And uh, I just have one example, which I do, I, which I give it give many times is that, you know, office is like an iPhone. I mean, when we change a phone every year, every two years, why don't we change an office every five years? When I say don't change an office, don't keep changing your location. Thanks, please be with us, that's fine. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that create an office in a way or create an environment in a way that can change every year, every two years, that can have employees come back and not face the monotony that they would feel in a very conventional design. Let's say you were sitting in the office for the, for, for you have a conventional space. You typically don't rebuild the space for the next five to seven to eight years in most of the conventional leases, right? Our endeavor is to provide them innovation, technology, uh, hospitality, uh, travel around the world, bring best, best in class knowledge and information that we can integrate into our overall infrastructure and these services that will help them and help people to see every year that, you know, I'm coming back to a new environment. So that is where I think we focus a lot on. And if you see in the past, and probably the others could help me out too, and Ramesh, probably you even more than me, is that you know earlier the fixed desk were used to be 80% versus collab 20%. I think now that is changing rapidly, right? People are looking at more flexibility in terms of collaborative spaces, more touch points, no fixed desks, for example. And I think that is changing. So hence, I feel that it should be like an iPhone. I mean, that's what an example I give to all the guys in our office, in our company as well. Why do we have to build an office thinking five years? Why don't we build an office only thinking a year? Make it modular, make it more design friendly. Go back in your and say, guys, you know what? This is boring. I only find it boring myself after a year. Let's, let's redo something so that it's more freshing, more engaging every year. So that's what our endeavor is to see that uh, we are able to bring that innovation and redesign the office. Every, I know it's expensive, but redesign doesn't have to be necessarily expensive. It could be very, very minimal things to make it more and more refreshing every year. So that's what we uh, focus on a lot, yeah. Karan, today I was actually with a client uh, who used to have a 2080, like you said, uh, 20 collab and uh, 80 uh, 
80 fixed. Uh, he's gone just the other way. Now it's become yeah. 80 20. 80 yeah. collab and 20 fixed, and a big yeah. global company. And that's actually helped them save space by around uh, 40 45% lesser space. It's so, uh, some path breaking stuff uh, happening around the world. So, on that, so. Absolutely, yeah, Ramesh. Yeah. So, uh, Natish, let me come to you. Uh, even now, close to 80 88% of uh, all space of flex uh, t- stock is uh, in the top uh, top tier one uh, cities. Uh, what's your take on tier two, tier three cities? Off late, there's been a lot of uh, talk around it, especially in the last uh, one year or uh, so. What are the what do you see are the opportunities there? I definitely think tier two, tier three also has a lot of potential. Just it's just where you can allocate. Uh, or where would you want to grow first? Because the appetite in the top nine cities in India is only that big that you can keep growing here uh, before you go to the tier two city, right? But I think our uh, 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 sort of strategy to enter is that we want to get into tier two cities. Uh, in fact, we've just uh, signed our center in Jaipur. Uh, so that's the first uh, tier two entry that we're getting into. But uh, we will open in other tier two city- cities, but it won't be with the same scale that we have in the tier one cities. The strategy for a tier two is going to be uh, visibly different, more towards the co-working uh, slash smaller uh, managed office solution. And then our campus-like settings, our larger uh, office centers are the ones which are going to keep continuing in the tier one cities. But I think in, in terms of potential, tier two and tier three in India does have that potential. Is it maybe a few quarters or a few years early? Yes, I don't think you can venture into a tier two city and be very, very aggressive, but it is a good time to venture in for sure. Uh, with What would be your uh, top four or five uh, cities you would pick t- uh, in tier two? So in tier two, uh, in, in terms of immediate expansions, you've got Jaipur, Ahmedabad, Kochi, uh, Coimbatore and Indore. I think, think all these five cities are very different and very unique uh, in the kind of office space demand and proposition that they have for uh, uh, you know the office, office goers. So I think as a strategy, we want to enter all of these five cities within this year. Got it. Uh, Natish Parth, uh, it's not easy for a company uh, which is used to traditional workspace to suddenly move into uh, a new uh, co-working kind of an environment. So uh, any thoughts around uh, what are the change management uh, steps a company should do uh, during this phase? Uh, <coughs> Ramesh, you're, you're, you're absolutely buying on. It's not easy. I think uh, there's been a clear shift from the earlier position that uh, management was kind of doing things to people, right? Hey, look, this is a new office, brand new office. Enjoy it. Uh, human, the human brain is not really wired and or re- really comfortable with change when you're not warned about it in advance. And none of us are big you know, fans of uh, change, right? So from an organization's perspective, what has happened is that uh, what COVID has really taught us is that hey, look, here is proof of concept around change itself, right? That teams can actually go through drastic changes without warning in a very short span of time and you more or less come out of it fine, right? So the smart organizations are actually using this narrative to drive down change much more aggressively, I think, than they did in the past. There was always this fear, right? Will this be accepted? But there is one, you know, kind of strikingly visible aspect around this is this, uh, is the fact that, you know, People are being listened to. Empathy has taken center stage in all change initiatives in organizations. So a lot of these uh, change initiatives are being co-created. Also, I mean, uh, from my pers- uh, from my perspective, I see increased value and kind of respect for office spaces in driving change in India. Now, when a new office is conceptualized, or let's say there's some uh, you know kind of refurbishment, like Karan was referring to, that you, you need to keep on changing the design once in a while. A corresponding change communication plan includes activities from the early stage of conceptualization, which is never the case earlier. So gone are the days when, you know, when an employee actually comes in to a brand new office on, on, the, on the go live day, and that's the first time he's seeing the office. No, he's informed about it in advance. He's warned about it. He's actually warmed up about it you know, well in advance. A lot of senior management or senior leadership is actually seeing this as a fantastic opportunity, I think, to roll out uh, innovation initiatives, I mean, which always involves change. I mean, uh, I mean, things which are always kept in the back burner for the fear of failure. Now it's like uh, the leadership is actually saying, hey, look, how agile we can be, you know, responding to COVID. So let's try and see 
something new and let's see what happens. So leadership to that extent are becoming a little, uh, you know, fearless. Thanks, uh, but let me take this uh, opportunity to share some of the insights which we've been kind of, uh, 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 we've got studying uh, the entire uh, managed office and co-working uh, industry. We, we realized that there are close to 3,500 centers across, uh, across the country, uh, close to 43 million uh, square feet of uh, today's space. Out of that 43 million, uh, close to 38 million square feet is uh, in metro cities. Uh, the balance, uh, 5 million, is uh, in uh, non-metro cities. So that's uh, around 88% of the total uh, stock was in uh, metro. Uh, the pandemic actually uh, provided uh, an opportunity for uh, operate, uh, operators to uh, look at non-metro locations. So one year back, we were not talking uh, about uh, tier two, or two years back, we weren't talking, talking about tier two uh, cities. Occupiers today, we see a lot of them are establishing their sales and regional offices and co-working centers, especially in tier two uh, cities. Uh, Non-metro cities, uh, since the beginning of uh, COVID, uh, that's like Q2, Q3, 2020, uh, 20, uh, in, in the last one year alone, we have seen close to 925 new centers uh, come up in uh, non-metro cities. Many of them are actually uh, small. Uh, we predict by uh, 2024, uh, flex space uh, would total uh, to 60 million from the current uh, 43 uh, million uh, square feet. Some of the new new innovations we have seen uh, co-working and managed office players give us uh, single day work passes, fitness centers, coffee shops, hangout uh, hangout spaces, gaming zones, uh, virtual uh, events. Karan spoke about that. Concierge uh, services personal assistance, uh, wellness-related uh, services, offerings. So these are some of the new things which you're seeing. On the technology front, we are seeing uh, very data-driven uh, 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 expansion plans, which uh, everybody is uh, supporting uh, you with. A lot of focus around security, a lot of focus around uh, wellness, uh, and uh, everybody focusing on how they could uh, improve uh, occupier uh, experience. Uh, the other insights uh, which uh, which we've got uh, also includes that uh, we believe going forward, around 20% of the overall office demand is expected to come uh, from uh, this industry. Last year, it was 15. There were a couple of cities where actually it's uh, crossed around 40%, but overall, it was only 15%, which is still a very big uh, number, given that uh, India uh, absorbs anywhere between 30, 35 million uh, square feet of office space uh, every year. We expect more consolidation in this uh, industry. Uh, large enterprises will uh, continue to uh, drive demand. Technology, we believe, will be a key uh, differentiator between uh, between players. And uh, co-working uh, operators uh, who are uh, focused uh, on increased uh, wellness, increased uh, sanitization, increased social distancing, uh, personal hygiene uh, would definitely do uh, better than uh, others in the current uh, current uh, environment. Overall growth, we believe the industry over the next three, four years will grow at a pace of around 20 to 20, 22%. Uh, the close to, uh, I spoke about the number of uh, the square footage, we believe we're close to 550,000 odd, uh, odd seats. Bangalore is the city with the, the most number of uh, seats. Uh, close to 45% of uh, enterprise deals uh, are uh, done by tech uh, tech companies. Uh, many operators, nearly 250 uh, different uh, uh, operators uh, across uh, across the uh, uh, country. And uh, the top 10 operators uh, alone, uh, of which uh, the, the two of them are uh, here, I would say the top five operators uh, are here in the panel today. Uh, they occupy around uh, 60% of the total uh, seats and just between them, the top 10 uh, operators have around 330,000 uh, uh, seats. Uh, so those are some uh, insights uh, from our uh, recent uh, research uh, around the sector. Karan, let me uh, come, back to, uh, come back to you. Uh, there is suddenly a lot of competition and a lot of uh, entrants. What are some of the key challenges you're facing? As a uh, uh, industry, I remember post COVID, uh, uh, the co-working industry went through a lot of stress uh, as uh, with short-term leases, people started terminating, 
freelancers anyway didn't turn up uh, small companies who had taken those monthly three month six month kind of uh, things they terminated their contracts what are some of the current challenges uh, you see in the sector uh, just to uh, answer i think firstly unfortunately we did not ever enter the uh, the short term uh, leasing business so that completely kept us away from the uh, termination during the the covid period so that was uh, uh, pretty much good for us in the last two three years. Uh, having said that, I think uh, more than competition, I think it is the way we see the industry, and this is totally my perspective. Is that uh, I think many of the uh, flex players and could be on any number. You know, there there's a lot of uh, the the overall uh, product is based on price, uh, not the value. So I think that is one aspect that everybody needs to focus on, and which typically, which I feel, and this is my personal perspective like i said if you put price over value you kind of start uh building substandard products providing substandard services and which typically leads to a lot of lack of innovation i would say i think what we and this and really you know if you look at the a-line business uh ramesh and everybody else on the panel or you look at the uh the, the seed business really uh or the or or the or the businesses like Airtel and Vodafone, right? If you start reducing price, you're typically hurting the industry as a whole. So I think if if all flex uh, operators focus on value versus price, number one, and also as a company, what we do is we try to bring in a lot of uh, best in class solutions and service capabilities to all our clients, and this obviously is done by by creating world-class leadership teams, introducing innovation for every client. Let's say we've got a client, for example, uh, a Salesforce, right? Who's got a very, very large client. Can you provide the same value, service, hospitality, uh, design uh, to your client who's also occupying 50 seats? I think that is where, uh, that is what we focus on, right? We have to give the same experience to everybody. So I think uh, challenge, yes, of course, there is a there is a price challenge for everybody and uh, anybody can probably vouch for that. But I feel if we all focus on value over price uh, and that will typically be a very positive change for our entire industry. Thanks. Uh, Nitish, uh, do you agree with the uh, current value over price? I, I completely agree with that, right? I, obviously, I don't, uh, while price is uh, the most important thing that you sort of negotiate on, uh, everything else comes much later. And the Indian mindset is that even if the price is the best, you will go and negotiate. So uh, price will always be, uh, you should put value over price. I completely agree. Uh, but I also think that it is a requirement for this industry to grow at the pace that you're projecting, Ramesh, that you, that you maintain a certain price point and you grow around with that price point across India, right? You can't essentially be creating products which are super highly priced and uh, then expect to uh, expect the industry to grow uh, as quickly. Uh, you know, so I, I think there is a, uh, I put value up there, but price is also uh, uh, equally important. Uh, because I think our, our our strategy is essentially we want to do everything to get the cost down and hence pass that price back to the customers. And that's what we've been working for. When we invest in technology or, or we are getting some uh, new innovation done, uh, we invest in things that help reduce cost first and then start in investing in things. Because at the end of the day, it needs to make commercial sense or any company to choose this over and above the uh, traditional office space. And like Karan mentioned, we don't do monthly deals or yearly deals or the other co-working deals, uh, which essentially where you can still expect uh, the, the, the incoming uh, clients to pay a slight amount of premium. Um, but I, I think it all depends on how do you value your own product, right? What is the price point that you want to maintain? There, uh, Karan mentioned something about airlines. Even today, you open uh, Make My Trip, you'll see uh, Vistara listed at X price and uh, Indigo listed at Y. Both of them make money, probably Indigo makes more, but uh, it'll always be at a at a lower price point, even if the occupancies are uh, there, because the product is designed in a way in which it can scale to more and more people, uh, right? So, and that's, that's just how uh, we uh, think of our strategy. So both of you, Karan and Nitish, uh, you both uh, obviously customize uh, based on what the client uh, wants. 
what is the typical density uh, you are seeing uh, square footage uh, per uh, person these average, days average i think average density uh, in fact has uh, has gone uh, down as in the most square footage has started been taken per seat pre pandemic i think we were able to achieve uh, close to about 65 70 i see that number now go to 80 85 because people have now started looking at collab spaces uh, you know creating other amenities within their office spaces because uh, companies have realized people have stayed back home for the last two years they've had the comfort at their houses you need to now look at office spaces in which you can give them a mix of both you can give them comfort as well as uh, the workstation and chair where they can, they can be produ- uh, productive right so uh, we are seeing this trend go towards about 80 between 80 to 90 depending on the type of company that you are servicing uh, it would be the national average karan come on man our national average is quite a lot currently we are at about 125 but uh, yes but that is also because i think there's a, a bucket of clients that we have and that takes up the average but i think uh, adding to nitesh's point that because like i mentioned in the uh, sometime back over this call and uh, so did uh, martha ji that uh, you know the and so did you that the work the, the fixed desks uh, and the collab spaces have kind of changed so hence if you have more collab spaces though you might have a reduction in your overall space but then at the same time your density also goes higher so hence i we feel we are at about between the 85 to 100 kind of a range at the moment if we take out the outliers yeah got it so uh, one more point on pricing let's take mumbai and delhi out and uh, let's look at the it cities bangalore chennai hyderabad pune where is the sweet spot in terms of uh, price per desk nitesh and karan again uh, to both of you where are you seeing that so you, can, you can go first <laughs> I can go first this time if I don't have a problem. See, I think there are different different ways. Uh, I think uh, Nitish uh, and his firm, um, uh, you know, provide. But the sweet service. spot. Where do you yeah, see yeah, the so most? I'm, I'm just trying to first explain and give you a background, Ramesh, over here. I think everybody, uh, everybody uh, puts on an offer in a very different manner. There are some some people do it in a per seat basis. Some people call it in a per square feet basis. Some 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 peers would do it on a per works uh, production seat basis. We largely do it only on a production seat basis, right? and we don't do a full seat calculation this is from just from our the way we function right so when we have a deal which is for 200 workstations we only bill for 200 workstations we don't add on uh, additional seats us our sweet spot in hyderabad for a per workstation is close to about 14 and a half to 15 and a half thousand rupees a desk somewhere in that range uh, bangalore is somewhere roughly about 18 to 19 and bombay and delhi like you said let that be on the side because the rentals are much higher chennai we've just started to be honest about a couple of months back but we are looking at a 12 12 and a half thousand kind of uh, range but i know uh, nitish uh, uh, has uh, and smartwatch does have a great presence and kudos to you guys um, but we feel at this moment that is the kind of range that we are trying to achieve uh, or rather have achieved with a couple of uh, transactions that we've done nitish your sweet spot i think I think the speed spot. Whenever we go and source a building, we want to keep the pricing between nine to eleven thousand. Uh, I think that's the average price that you maintain essentially in the entire building. Um, uh, for us, uh, these cities, why nine to eleven thousand is also essentially uh, uh, calculated in a way in which we want to prove that we are cheaper than a traditional office space. When we go out to our clients, we don't go out and claim that you pay us a little extra for the flexibility that we give you. We in fact say that because you come to us. we will actually make it more economical than a traditional office space for you and typical india if you see uh, for an office to run its own space cost about 12 to 12 and a half thousand i think it was it was there also in one of the reports that 12 and a half to 13 thousand is the cost per uh, seat uh, which comes in india so if you can reduce that that is a, a significant amount of value uh, specifically in times like such where uh, you know people have not been coming to work and uh, offices are just a cost center for most of these companies uh nitish and uh, karan now uh, both of you have expanded uh, really fast uh, like i said earlier on there are close to 250 plus operators in the country today uh, all these uh, owner operators uh, are trying to create uh, valuations uh, trying to uh, probably uh, probably get private equity or maybe one day uh, list Uh, what is your advice uh, to a budding uh, entrepreneur who is uh, 
uh, who wants to get good valuation, what is uh, what should be his uh, next step? Someone who has, let's say, one or two or three uh, small uh, centers in a in a metro city or in a tier two city. What would your current uh, uh, current yours and Nitesh's uh, advice uh, be to them? I uh, I just have two basic advice. Essentially, one is you need to first identify what your differentiator is. Right, you cannot go after the market because there are already two fifty player, uh, players in the market. You can't go enter the market and expect that you are also going to be one of the larger ones. Right, you need to uh, find your differentiator and how uh, uh, are you going to make sure that the market also accepts that as a differentiator. I think that is very important. And then the second thing is you need to start thinking big, right? Like at any given point of time, uh, I, even if you you start small, your vision should be big enough so that you are able to scale uh, to that point, right? Today, if we are at 6 million uh, uh, square foot uh, across India, we're not thinking about getting to 8 or 10 million. Now we're thinking about getting to 35 million, right? So the idea is that if you really believe in the product, if you really believe in the model, then you should think big and make sure that you have your differentiator sorted before uh, you know pumping in your money and then subsequently the investors' money. Karan, great. I'll just kind of break it down uh, to what Nitish said. I think one is uh, I think one core value what uh, any new service provider. At the end of the day, guys, we all know it's just an office, right? Anybody with some or a little more than some money in the bank, they can build an office, start a space, rent out a space. I know that I don't have to make a building, I have to rent a space, uh, lease it out, I don't lease it out, I know that I get into trouble or I just keep leasing, subleasing it out, I make money. I think one is uh, any new player needs to think customer first, competition second. So like Nitesh said, think about your differentiator. What can you provide as a differentiator to your customer, right? Don't forget forget what the what the competition is doing. Secondly, I think you have to th have a vision of being an India landlord versus saying a very very city centric or a micro location. So you got to think. Of course, you got to think big. So you got to think about having multiple locations because if you do not, then somebody else who already got that larger footprint will take away that business. So of course, everybody starts small, and including any of the operators that we have on this panel or outside of this panel. But uh, yes, you got to have that presence, that footprint. Uh, that And the third most important thing is that anybody and everybody needs to figure out that this is not uh, just building an office. This is about creating a very, very safe and healthy environment to a lot of people who are coming back, coming to your office space. For example, if you go to a mall, it's a mall's responsibility to be providing you a very, very safe environment to come and shop in. Similarly, it's not just about building an office, but can you follow all the EHS compliance? Can you have the right kind of team and minds who will give you these kind of assurances and a health and a more, more uh, and much safer and secure environment to work in? So not just building an office or building a space to come and work. I think these things are extremely important for anyone to kind of focus on because uh, end of the day, the liability is very large, right? You've got 300, 400 people working out of your office. Anything goes wrong, it's, it's, it's going to be hurting very bad. So I think these are three takeaways I would say for anybody else who's going to start or get into this business. What's the thumb rule on valuations, uh, Karan and Nitish? Very high level thumb rules, uh, top line multiplier, bottom line multiplier. What is it like uh, in this industry? I think we're still... Uh, 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 figuring out what the benchmark should be. There has been deals which have happened uh, ranging from 1.5 times to 27 times. So you can't really have a 1.5 times uh, uh, top line revenue. to 27 times top line. Top line. Time, time top line. The deals have happened okay. across that uh, spectrum. But uh, essentially, uh, I think, uh, see, at this point of time, the industry is still very, very young. So it has to be a multiple of uh, the top line. Uh, essentially because it's a high growth uh, stage that uh, most of the players are in, right? So uh, I think uh, it cannot be valued at real, as real estate, right? Because at the end of the day, the day it is services. Uh, and that layer of services is what will help you grow quicker. Uh, so I think uh, something closer to what uh, hospitality chains and all of these guys are valued at about seven to eight times, nine times of, of revenue is what, uh, in my sense, is a fair value. Thanks, uh, Karan. I'll look at this slightly differently. I think uh, generating a top line revenue in this business and getting a multiplier is very different because this is not uh, where we own the asset. 
I think in this business, we are leasing and subleasing. I think it is extremely important to look at your bottom line and your EBITDAs. So I think this business really needs to be valued on the EBITDAs that you make. So what it could be 10 times, 15 times, 20 times, I don't know. And like just to, uh, uh, agreeing to Nitish's uh, point, it is a nascent industry. It is, there is no very, very, there's not a lot of benchmarking done. Of course, we know a couple of guys who've raised large equity as well. But I think given that it is a, it is a leasing and subleasing and not asset ownership business, this business should be valued on EBITDA, not the top line revenue. Nitish, I'm keen to know who's this person who got 27 times top line? I think there are multiple players. There are a few players from America who've gotten these numbers. Wow. Uh, so I think there was a trend uh, when you started up front, right? This was oh the back then. Okay, okay. I yeah, thought the currently. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, Parth, uh, where will one use AI and uh, IoT in uh, in this space? Actually, uh, you kind of alluded to that, uh, Ramesh, when you say, uh, said that data-driven decisions can be taken nowadays, and it's very true. Uh, and, and I mean, the difference now is that, uh, you know, you can actually curate personalized experiences, like the kind of experiences that Karan spoke about. You can actually curate that on the basis of real-time data when an office is operational. And this is not really done before. Uh, and, uh, and talk about, you know, energy efficiency of a building also. Uh, you can actually now make the building infrastructure respond on the basis of occupancy. And in the simplest of examples, like the intensity of, let's say, services like you know, lighting and air conditioning will, can change automatically depending on the occupancy levels of a particular space. Now, this essentially means sensors that senses the occupancy levels, which sends a signal to the IBMs, and that, that sends a signal to the building services to react. And this is IoT at work. Uh, easier said than done. I mean, uh, these things are being actually done as we uh, speak. However, of course, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, integration problem there because systems do not talk to each other. But eventually, like, for example, I can send an email to you, Ramesh, but I cannot send a message from iMessage to WhatsApp. That, that's because they don't have open a, uh, uh, APIs. And this is going to change in the IBMs as well. So if you, if you add a layer of AI to this and say integrate your online collaboration tools like MS Teams, your seat booking app, uh, to the physical meeting rooms as well, you can see predictive analytics at play. Like for example, Ramesh, if you have a meeting, let's say with me and I want to come to your office. So your app could actually tell you, hey, Ramesh, you have a meeting with Parth at two o'clock. Would you like me to book that room for you? So these kind of things are actually being done. And uh, once the physical room gets blocked and when you walk in, the lighting and the air conditioning will actually adjust to your liking on the basis of your previous choices of your temperature and lighting. So these things are actually being done. There's a bit of struggle there, but I think we're getting there. Yeah. Order. I think uh -huh. I'd just like to add uh, one more thing to that, right? Also, I, I think it's also about re-strategizing of space. Why IoT and AI will play a very important uh, role is people don't know what the future of office is going to be, right? Everyone is still contemplating, deciding on how would they want to structure their offices. At this point, if you can actually give them the, that data, you know, how many employees are coming on a regular basis? Where are which part of the offices are they using? How are they using these offices? Are they more productive in open cafe, open areas? They're spending more time in open collab zones, or are they going into meeting rooms and spending more time there? What is the utilization of your uh, meeting rooms and real estate uh, at the end of the day? All of this data has become very very valuable for a company to actually take a call. And it's not like earlier, right? Where it was a one size fits it all or one company because Google does it, because Facebook does it. We need to do that too. Every company has now become very unique, has a different skill set. Even within technology, there are different sort of uh, talent that you're hiring. Uh, uh, you know, so I think uh, all of this data has become very valuable for people to take a uh, office space decision. So it's become a necessity uh, in the long run to implement all of this upfront now. Got it, Natish. Uh, Sapna, you want to take a couple of uh, audience questions? There is one interesting question that we have here is, uh, you know, everyone's been talking about IoT and uh, technology in co-working. What does metaverse mean for co-working? So uh, I can take it for all our speakers if they can add to it. How, how does metaverse is, you know, are we going to see co-working in metaverse now? I don't uh, understand that. Uh, anyone who can who wants to yeah. take that? Sure, sure. Natish? No, 
Yeah. No, I think it's a very uh, uh, you know we don't know what is going to really happen. We already uh, have Facebook uh, Horizon. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. There are a b- bunch of people who are already uh, talking about it or getting into it. Uh, I think it's a very uh, interesting concept if you are able to implement it. I don't think it is going to be something that is going to challenge co-working because the services angle still have to be there. It can be something which sort of complements. uh and puts this product in the virtual world as well uh where it can be an extension right in the earlier uh you know chat before this someone had mentioned uh you know that there is a zoom fatigue which is kicking in there is people are not meeting face to face uh and that's why there is some challenges uh, which you face but i think metaverse can essentially solve that will that be a threat to the existing office space i highly doubt it i think people will have to create their own versions in in the metaverse also so right now we go to co-working ramesh to get us be getting into metaverse yes yes yeah co-working players will definitely be uh, getting into metaverse i think it's a natural na- natural uh, sort of extension to get into that uh, i think for now we go to ramesh whenever we want advice and we want a uh, new space take up uh, he might have to even start a vertical to help us in the metaverse as well so next uh, time it will be ramesh 3d avatar in the metaverse <laughs> point point noted <laughs> So, Any um, other questions, Sapna? Yeah, Karan, you would like to add something to it, and Parth? Oh, I, I like um, correctly. I correctly said uh, it's too soon in the day to kind of comment on Meta Verse. We're all trying to figure out how we need to integrate Meta into our overall offering, but it it, it does look interesting, and uh, we also feel that uh, eventually it will kind of become a necessity more than an option to figure out whether uh, how to use the Meta Verse. Uh, the facebook metaverse yeah so we are having right. a very nascent stage at the moment to give you a very very robust answer but soon we'll come back to you with an answer yeah that's right patha and then we'll ask ramesh to now <laughs> summarize the panel patha your views yeah i mean uh, the thing about the metaverse uh, and what eventually will you know become of it is the fact that you can actually design every pixel in it you can curate personalized experiences right so if my avatar is going to for a meeting online with ramesh i can decide should i wear this jacket or what jacket you know i can buy that online and one can also buy you know uh, uh, virtual real estate now right so now see the user is now getting used to that personal experience online what it means is that when they walk into nitesh's office or current offices he will expect the same kind of personalization there that personalized experiences will have to be curated and we are in a position to actually do that now because we can take data driven decisions on the basis of all this information that nitesh spoke about that we can pick up from this different kinds of sensors that we have in the space so i think that's the change which will come in you will have to curate personal experiences in the physical workplace as well because of our getting used to the safe world of meta metaverse that's right i'm going to you yeah thanks uh, sapna we had a fantastic uh, uh, insightful uh, panel uh we started uh, with karan speaking about how uh, tech is uh, become uh, very very uh, essential thanks to uh, covid uh, nitesh spoke about how uh, how today there are a lot more engagement uh, engagement activities than ever before karan spoke about various engagement plat- platforms he is trying to create uh, to lighten mood lot of fun factors uh, one good insight i heard us karan is uh, through this he is trying to make them miss miss work so that they come back to his uh, centers and uh, fill up those uh, app controlled parking app controlled cafeterias app for health health and fitness those are some of the tech ideas we heard parth you spoke about how innovation is more being driven by the occupiers and uh, you warned us that one size doesn't uh, fit all karan you spoke about how uh, everyone is still figuring out uh, innovation it's constantly changing and uh, you you give a very interesting example of how offices like an iphone we change our phones uh, every couple of years so why not change office design every uh, once in a few uh, few years you also spoke about how the fixed to collab uh, uh, ratios are drastically uh, changing nitesh spoke about uh, the opportunities in uh, tier 2 his top uh, picks for tier 2 was jaipur ahmedabad cochin coimbatore and indore uh parth you spoke you spoke about how uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, opportunities to roll out uh, innovation uh, initiatives uh karan you spoke about it's not a price game it's uh, value over uh, price in terms of uh, sweet spot on size you uh, both of you felt 80 85 if you are on 90 square feet is the per square foot per person 
Karan uh, uh, spoke about how 14 to 18,000 is his sweet spot. Nitish spoke about 9 to 11,000 being his uh, sweet spot. Uh, in terms of advice to uh, budding uh, entrepreneurs, uh, uh, Nitish, you spoke about how one needs to identify a differentiator. Think big. Uh, you spoke about how you are 6 million square feet now and you're looking at becoming a 35 million uh, square feet uh, company. Uh, Karan, you spoke about customer first, competition uh, second. Think uh, India, not uh, just one uh, location, but focus on uh, health and uh, safety. Uh, more importantly, in terms of uh, valuations, uh, we discussed uh, 1.5 to 27 times of uh, top line. Uh, but overall, we agreed that given that it's a new industry, uh, multiplier on top line is uh, important, although current felt that bottom line is also uh, quite uh, quite key in terms of uh, uh, the multiplier. Create uh, technology depending on the occupier, that's what, the, uh, that's what Path said. And integration is still not seamlessly happening between what the occupier has and what uh, some of the developers and uh, architects are uh, offering. Uh, so some, some re-strategizing space is required before you finally get uh, all the AI and uh, IoT uh, uh, at work uh, in the facility. So I thoroughly uh, enjoyed uh, moderating this uh, panel. Sabna, thanks for uh, having me. And uh, thank you, uh, fantastic uh, panel, uh, Parth, Nitish, uh, and Karan. Thanks for joining us. Thanks and so catch you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Great speaking to you. Thank Bye. you, everyone, for those very thought-provoking uh, you know, pointers that you mentioned in the in this discussion. So thank you everyone for being here with us. Thank you, Partha. Thank you, Karan Chopra. Thanks, Nitesh. And thanks, Ramesh Naya for being here and for this wonderful session.